All right. This is the uh, the second of six modules um, around quality student enrollment, the functional training. And today we're going to talk about the enrollment environment. Okay. Sounds like we still have a few people settling in. Um, Kara, I'm going to hit the full screen button. Okay. Thanks. Did you finish your lunch? Gobbled it down. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Lunch time on the on the East Coast, so I think people are settling in with their goodies. All right, just a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. And again, if you're not speaking, please mute. Toronto, can you please mute? Make a couple calls. Can you please mute Toronto? <laughs> the ladies who are laughing, can you please mute? They're asking for muting. i got to put a mute up. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to set a little bit of context for our session today, and then we're going to jump right into the material. Um, we've got first up, people and permissions. Um, we're going to talk about concepts and terminology around people and permissions, and, and then dig into services. Um, setup really has, what we've termed the functional area of setup, really has two primary components to it. It relates to time, and there's um, that would be your academic years and terms. And so we actually have some wireframes that we can look at to help get a visual um, understanding of what we mean by these <coughs> things of years and terms. Uh, again, we'll cover concepts and terminology and the service associated services. There's another aspect to set up, which is really about setting up the environment, um, particularly as it relates to registering. There's a lot of sort of set up around, you know, when students can register and, and what are some of the rules around registration, et cetera, that need to be set up. And then there's also setting up the catalog of holes and exemptions. So we also have a few wireframes to look at for this content area. Again, we'll cover concepts and terminology and services. Um, then we're going to try and place this in the larger context by circling back and looking at our application map so you can understand. Oh, surprise, Christina, that's a new agenda item. <laughs> that we can look at our application map and where these areas of functionality can be found on the application map. Um, and then I'm going to walk you through the supporting materials because, again, the idea is that you can walk away from these sessions and dig into the materials. Um, so I just want to give you a little orientation about where to find things and how they're sort of structured and et cetera. So we're going to follow um, the way this session is set up today, unlike the previous, uh, the previous training. Sorry, I can't talk and scroll at the same time. Let me find the agenda here. Um, this session is really meant to be more interactive than the last one because I think we have a smaller, more focused group of participants, people who will actually be doing the work of analyzing requirements. Um, so we welcome questions in this session. Um, what I've done is just try to time box each topic so to make sure that we have enough time to get through each topic. We, I don't know exactly how long each area will take for us. It kind of depends on audience participation. So these max durations are just kind of to keep us um, on a pace that we can get through everything. So if there's good discussion, thing, you know, it's great. We can, we can capture the notes. But if we have to move on, we have to move on because we have a, a fair amount to cover today. So these max end times are times at which facilitator might cut off discussion if that's necessary. Um, as before, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. Um, there's a Google Doc where you can post your questions as we move through orientation if you don't feel comfortable asking um, verbally. So feel free to, to plop your questions in that Google Doc and I'll try to respond um, in line or, or we can use for our follow-up sessions. Okay, I think that's all the setup I wanted to do. Um, so um, if you recall, <laughs> this is somewhat complicated graphic of, of enrollment and how we're thinking about it from a functional framework that we really have, we have 10 areas of functionality. And what this slide is meant to do is to ground you again in, this, in the, those 10 functional areas and give you a sense of, the, of what we're covering today. 
So we're really concerned with this sort of outer loop of, you know, the big stuff you have to do to get the system set up before you can actually do the more interesting stuff of offering courses and programs and getting students in and out of them. So um, we're going to talk about setup and people and permissions. And setup is primarily an institution-facing, um, I mean, almost 100% institution-facing. There's very little in the way of student-facing functionality when it comes to setting up the system. When we talk about people and permissions, there's obviously a, a very large institution-facing component of getting users in, into the system and managing those users. But there also is some student-facing functionality in terms of managing their preferences and their own demographic information. So that's just the context. And I just want to remind you of the objectives and expectations for the training. You know, the overall objective for this training is to equip you with a solid understanding of our functional framework and um, knowledge about our business artifacts as they currently exist. So this is just kind of, this is where we are at this point. So um, it's just to get you caught up there. It's not to say that this is the truth with a capital T or that we're right about everything. It's just to let you know what our current thinking is. Um, that's the overall training objective. The objectives for today is a more in-depth understanding of the setup. So again, we talk about setup. We're talking about managing academic years and terms, managing the registration environment, managing holds and exemptions, and then looking at people and permissions, the area of people and permissions, which is managing people and managing permissions. I know I'm talking very fast, but I'm trying to get through this stuff. Um, just a quick word about this term manage, because we use this term a little bit loosely. Um, what I want to point out is that when we, talk, when we say manage, we generally, on the project, at least on the functional side, we mean it um, as shorthand to refer to, A, your basic CRUD operations, so your create, read, update, and delete. Um, there could be some other content dependent functionality like searching or grouping or establishing relationships in between those, but managing kind of refers to a whole pile of, you know, stuff that you can do to, to something. But, and, you know, there's always a but, uh, on some cases we call out create separately from manage. Um, the reason for this is sometimes the initial creation process is so complex on its own that it really warrants considering it separately from your updating and deleting and reading. Um, if you think about the initial process of getting users into the system, creating those users, getting them into the system is probably much more onerous than actually, you know, tweaking demographic data about those. You may want to think of it as a, you know, a wedding versus a marriage. You know, the wedding is a big event, it's a big thing. You have to, you know, kind of think about it separately as, you know, what happens after. So create is, you'll see what it's called out specifically. It's because we really feel we need to consider the creation process on its own. If we don't call it out separately, then we assume to be part of manage. That's probably still a little confusing, but I just wanted to point it out. If you're confused, you're not alone. <laughs> so. All right, I think that's all I had. I think I'll hand it over now to Steve um, and Ruth to talk to you about people and permissions. Any questions? Nope. I'm going to stop sharing so you can pick it up. And I'll go on mute. Is everyone able to uh, view the uh, presentation? Yes. All right. As Carol said, we're going to start out talking about people and permissions. So people can be thought of as things, which we sometimes refer to as objects, actors, sometimes referred to as roles, or both, which as, uh, is on the slide, it's the ugly intersection between the two. Things or objects uh, relate to what do we need to know about them, what are the data attributes of them, and what can be done to them. So people as objects help derive attributes, which we'll get to when we talk about permissions. Actors or roles is, uh, are as concerned with what can they do. People have, as roles derive, uh, drive the permission sequence and, and structure. So students can be 
either objects because we do things to them in the system, or they can be actors where they actually register themselves or update their own information. If we talk more about people as objects, yeah, I wanted to point out the interface with the Quality Identity Management System, KIM, which is part of the RICE um, bucket of uh, shared middleware. Uh, in KIM, the terminology for people as objects are, is entities. That's the technical term they use. Examples of people as objects we, we've talked about, an admitted student, an instructor teaching specific course offerings, an advisor assigned to specific programs or students. So that association with the inst of the instructor with their course offerings is treating the instructor as an object. They are effectively a piece of data attached to an individual course offering. Likewise, a student's advisor may be assigned to them specifically, and so that association treats the advisor as an object. In quality student enrollment, we're primarily concerned with the student object. That's our largest group uh, of things. And so we treat the enrollment system as the system of record for the student as a thing or the student as an object. For others, we are mainly concerned with other people as actors. So these actors and objects are going to be um, created and derived usually from external and internal systems at the university. Instructors, advisors, administrators, others that will come from the institutional human resources and identity management systems. Until Kuali student has an admissions component, the majority of our students are going to come from either internal or external admission systems. Those objects also may be directly assigned to organizations. So within the um, organizational structure, you may have uh, colleges, schools, departments, academic programs, and people as objects will be assigned to those individual organizations. This enables several things in workflow and, and permissions as well. I'll pause there before we move on to see if we have any questions. Very good, we'll move on to the next slide. Creating and managing people as objects. If we look at students, the creation of their initial student population in the system will be from a data interface from our existing institutional student information systems. We have to bring over our current and historical population. On an ongoing basis, the majority of students will originate in some form of and their creation will also be accomplished through a data interface to institutional admission systems. Now those two interfaces hopefully will be the same API coming across. Certain graduate and professional schools may use a common outside service. For example, in the United States, the law schools and medical schools use a um, common service to process at least their applicant pools that may then get sent as data to the institutions. Uh, so those admissions interfaces will have to be written as well. But those may be uh, candidates for particular institutions to write those and contribute them back to the quality student enrollment portion. Quality student will also allow the creation of individual student records by authorized users to accommodate those students not participating in an admission process. An example of this would be students who are not pursuing a degree program but would like to take four credit classes. So there will be a mechanism developed to deal with uh, getting those records created. Any question at this point? All right, moving on. Yeah, continuing with creating and managing people as objects in the student realm, uh, there's a large amount of data that is available and is used in different standards that we hope to accommodate. This includes names of various and sundry types, legal names, nicknames, maiden, married, professional, et cetera. Um, demographic information like the birth date, the birthplace, gender history, ethnicities, First Nation status for our uh, Canadian friends. Contact information, which we use to categorize all physical mailing addresses, email addresses of various types, telephone numbers, and any type of social media communication. 
I'm sorry, we citizenship information including countries of citizenship because we know some allow multiple countries of citizenship, immigration information and visa status. Institutions need to deal with resident, residency information for tuition calculation purposes, so that information will be maintained. And any of a variety of identifiers, whether it's a, a university-specific ID number, a net ID, a social security number in the United States, a social insurance number in Canada, the CVIS number for international students in the United States, or any other form of identifier. Questions at this point? Uh, sorry, y'all. Um, it's Marie from Northwest. Can uh -huh. you hear me? Um, what is the unique identifier in um, people, around people? Um, do every person get in, or will any student in, in enrollment get a unique identifier number? or something, or is it going by name, or how is that going to work? Most institutions will assign a unique identifier to the particular student, so in, in that case that would be the university ID number. Some institutions use their network ID. Um, in the United States we have used um, the social security number for domestic students, but we're no longer allowed to. Uh, display that publicly, so we we use that kind of behind the scenes. But there isn't a one universal unique identifier across the country that would be used. Right. So, um, I think that whatever whatever uh, identifier you currently use, whatever way you have currently of uniquely mm -hmm. identifying your students, KS would accommodate that. Okay. No, that's all. Thank you. perspective, we recognize that, in fact, there may be multiple IDs for individuals, and so we are going to actually have to manage that as well. Okay, moving on. So our initial development will concentrate on the administrative functions and ability to manage information about students, so capturing it all registrar's office, uh, departmental people being able to update and maintain it will be in the first phase. The later development will provide students with self-service functions to manage their own personal information, um, and institutions will be able to identify and configure um, locally which data elements students will be able to maintain themselves. So everything won't be necessarily be available to them at the institution's discretion. All right, moving on. Creating and maintaining people as objects in the realm of instructors. As we mentioned before, interfaces from the institutional human resources systems to Kim will provide the majority of the pool of instructors. We may also need interfaces from institutional identity management systems to Kim uh, to provide information on instructors who are not university employees. For example, adjuncts or visiting professors, et cetera. Um, at USC, for example, the ROTC instructors are actually employees of the Department of Defense and aren't USC employees. So we handle them through our um, identity management system here. And so those types of um, individuals would be accommodated to, uh, through Kim through those interfaces. The long-term desire is to maintain qualifications of instructors such as certifications, special knowledge areas, preferred subject areas for teaching, um, in order to leverage that information to make assignments to course offerings when courses are being scheduled for a term. But that is a later development, and that's why it's listed as a long-term desire. And we envision that we will be required uh, to maintain additional information in, in quality students accommodate in order to deal with specific things that wouldn't come out of those other systems. Any questions? Just to pause on that point, so, you know, HR would be the system of record for instructors, but there is recognized at least longer term that there may be some data about instructors that we would store and manage on the KSI that have specifically to do with, um, you know, as Steve mentioned, their 
teaching qualifications and certifications and things that directly impact what things they get assigned to teach. I don't know. I just felt the need to make that point, Steve. That's <laughs> Moving <fun>. on. Okay. <laughs> So our next group of uh, people that we need to create and manage as objects are administrators of various sorts. So those administrators may either be central or departmental. Central tends to be groups like the registrar's office. Departmental would be academic departmental representatives or perhaps school representatives. They have an, uh, usually some elevated um, abilities on the system. Uh, once again, we'll need interfaces from our institutional HR systems to Kim to provide the pool of these administrators. We'll need, uh, likewise, institutional identity management systems to Kim to provide information on administrators, not in university employees. Once again, I mentioned ROTC staff is a similar way. Um, and that includes people that aren't instructors. And we'll require additional information, again, to main, be maintained in KS, which Kim does not accommodate for the reasons that Carol just mentioned. So that, that concludes our discussion about people as objects. And before we move on to people as actors, do um, we have any more questions? OK, moving on. At this point, we're going to turn it over to Ruth to handle permissions. So I will find a way to stop sharing. Um, we'll accept Ruth's request. Okay, um, just uh, let me know when you can see. Thinking, thinking. I can see now. You can see? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, permissions a little bit here, um, starting with people as actors. And again, that's what can they do. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to let them do it. Um, as we keep mentioning Kim, we know that KS will leverage Kim and KROD and the Rice modules. And in a little bit, um, Kathy will go into more detail about the strategy to leverage these, the Rice modules. Um, Actors in Kim, I just want to point out, are called principles. Um, but going through here, we're going to talk about um, the different things that people could do. They could be associated with organizations, a college or a department. And actors may have roles. We know that an actor can have multiple roles, and they can change over time. And these roles might be assigned manually but they can also be derived by a person being an object. And we know this is a potentially ugly intersection, and in the next coming weeks and months, um, we'll be working through that to iron out the details. What, if I could just jump in, what we mean by the ugly intersection is you know, this idea of, of a type, a person type, or an object of students, and, and how that sometimes gets a, a little bit muddied with a role of a student. So, Sometimes sorting it, the same thing with instructor, like there's a thing that's an instructor and then there's also the permissions and the, and the things that they can do as an instructor and, and understanding that intersection um, can be a little bit tricky sometimes. So that's what we mean by the, by the ugly intersection between the objects and the roles and making sure we're clear when we're not conflating the two. That's all. Okay, so in the chaos world, we tend to use permissions and authorization as interchangeable terms. But what we're really trying to do is refer to the ability to access different functionality in KS. Those examples can include entering grades, waiving prereqs, scheduling classes, updating academic records. In Kim, permissions are a little more fine-grained, and they have a little bit different terminology, like can save, can edit. So keep in mind, I might use the word permission and authorization back and forth here, but I'll try and be consistent. We have the concept of roles in the chaos world, and that's really a collection or a bucket of authorizations, what a person can do. And these may be defined 
based on an organization or more globally. For example, you might have a general department admin role, which may have specific authorizations that that role, any, that that role you'd be allowed to do those functions. You might then have a more specific departmental role because in a smaller department, the staff may have to do more functions than you would in a larger department. So there needs to be the flexibility to have global ones, but then also specific ones. And by creating these roles, it's a way to facilitate granting authorizations to different groups of people. Rather than having to continue to do it one at a time, you can attach a role to a person, and they'd be given a set of permissions. Um, it makes it easier to maintain. And there's also going to be the ability to adjust on an individual. So even though I may have assigned a scheduler role to a person, I might add some authorizations to that specific person or remove them. I'll pause there, make sure that was clear. See if anyone had any questions. We have a concept of a person type. A uh, person type, there can be many different person types, uh, but this is really the relationship between the individual and the institution, and will then help determine the context for how that individual will interact with KS. While there can be many different person types, our focus right now is really on the administrator, instructor, and student. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Based on a person type, we know that there has to be a minimum amount of data required to create such a person, and that will change by type. We also know that there could be multiple types for, you can have, for example, a graduate student who might also be an instructor, and these may change over time as well. What we're still working out is whether there will be a concept of a primary person type. I want to talk next a little bit about qualifiers. Um, and qualifiers are really an attribute on a person which would constrain the authorization. You may have a person, and in our examples here, you may have a faculty member who is allowed to enter grades based on their role, but you want them only to be able to enter grades for which they are in the instructor of record. Another example would be if you're authorized to schedule classes, the authorization needs to be constrained to only classes for the department. You don't want them scheduling classes for everything. There's also the concept of a negative qualifier. Um, for example, I can update academic records based on my authorizations, but you wouldn't want me to have the ability to update my own personal record. And next I want to talk a little bit about delegating authority. And really delegating authority is meant for a short term, for a very short term. It's not giving somebody authority going forward. But the idea is that I would be able to grant my specific authorities to somebody else. For example, I'm going on a business trip and I'm going to be gone for three weeks and I need somebody to be able to waive prereqs so students can register in a course. Please mute if you're not presenting. One of the key points that we wanted to point out on the delegating authority is that even though I've been granted permission to do a, a certain activity, the system will note who did that, even though if I've if been assigned by Professor Smith to be able to grant an exception, an exemption, I want to make sure that the system indicates that I did it and not Professor Smith. Are there any questions on permissions? Okay. 
Okay, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kathy to go into a little more detail on the strategy for the rice modules. Hi, everybody. Hit the right. One second. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll take this pause in the action to, to note that um, particularly for uh, the business analysts on the project, um, the services portions are, are pretty important. Um, you know, maybe let, for your subject matter experts, this is where we may lose you a little bit uh, for the more functionally oriented folks, but for the business analysts, you know, it's really important to understand the, the, the service strategy and the service contracts um, for the work that moving forward and when we go into parallel delivery. So pay attention. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm trying to share my screen. Let me know when you it's see there. it. It's there. 